we'll see if other people arrive. Uh, aloha, everybody. It's um, for everybody except me and Corey. It's Saturday, September the 3rd. 2022 here in the United States, it's still Friday, September the 2nd. And this is Supporting Holistic Systems, which is um, our chance once a month to explore um, nonviolent communication and social change. And uh, today's topic is uh, from information warfare to information peacemaking. And I'll talk more about that in just a minute. Let's just do um, uh, let's do, I, I'd like to start with uh, one minute of um, silence in honor of one of our colleagues, um, Robert uh, K. Is, uh, died this last week unexpectedly, he's a certified trainer living in Portugal. And uh, he was uh, 56 years old and was killed in a car wreck unexpectedly. And it's really taken, I just talked to him a week and a half ago. And it, it really has um, affected our community a lot. So I thought in honor of Robert, who was a lover of social change, that we would just take one minute of silence in his honor. Anybody unwilling to do that? Okay. Thank you. Let's see here. I notice I'm feeling a little tender doing that. Also, um, very curious about our topic today and what, we, what I will learn. Hopefully you'll learn something too. And um, I notice uh, one of the one of the stories that we have about uh, being parents, Jory and I, is that our children are like little pieces of our heart wandering around in the world. And right now, Jory, who's a big piece of my heart, she's out wandering around in the world. She's visiting her sisters in Florida. One of her sisters had. Um, uh, surgery uh, yesterday. Everything's good. But I just noticed that I have that sense of, um, of noticing that something's missing. My bed is empty. Don't have anybody to fight over the sheets with right now. <laughs> <clears throat> so what I'd like to invite as a check in today is I'd like you to um, to share your name and um, and how you're feeling kind of NVC style. And then give us one piece of information about you, a piece of information about you. <clears throat> so just think about what you would like to share about a piece of information. And uh, whoever's ready can start and then you can call on somebody else or invite somebody else. Tomomi. I start. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tomomi. I live in Sydney. I'm feeling um, a little bit confused and um, kind of. I was wondering, Jim, if you were going to open this room today. And I'm glad you are opening. And I 
the same time. If you'd like to step out, I understand anytime. Um, one piece of my uh, information right now, uh, I just uh, finished putting the subtitle on the uh, one of uh, Robert's TED talk in Japanese because uh, I have a passion about uh, putting whatever material, NVC material in English into Japanese. So that's a piece of information about me. Thank you. I tag Veva, if you're ready. Um, my name is Vega. I feel a bit still sleepy. <laughs> And uh, curious about today's title as well, because that's uh, where we are at in our community. <laughs> Overflowing information and uh, conflict. And uh, my, what about me is, uh, um, I love dancing. <laughs> yeah. And, I call Julia. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm feeling I'm I'm sick. I have a, I caught a call, so I'm feeling sore in my body, but at the same time, very happy that I could join the call. Uh, and um, a piece of information about me. Uh, yesterday, I I was or I already caught the call. The, and I was feeling really unwell, but I, uh, we had a, a meeting schedule to meet with UNICEF, who is my partner here in Beijing, in China, and we delivered a, a short mindfulness session, and that was very, very uh, dear to my heart and important. So I went, even though I was sick, and I loved it. I met great people, and after the 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 session, I was feeling less sick. And it was amazing. And we're looking forward for more work with UNICEF here. And um, I will call um, Rina. Yeah, um, I live in Dharamsala, India. And um, um, yeah, it's, it's like, I'm, I'm meeting a lot of animals around here and uh, wondering whether they were here before because, you know, there's a forest here. And so it's a new kind of a new approach to life and living on a land where I am conscious that I am the newcomer and how can I share or get out of the way of the animals that that visit so it's quite an interesting uh, uh, way of being here and one thing about me that i celebrate is that i have be, i am a part of a small team that has translated uh, marshall's language of life in gujarati and it's ready and now i'm you know following up for to print it yeah and that's also I want to bring so many people closer to peace and to themselves in my mother tongue. So I'm excited to connect with more people and speak more in my mother tongue. Um, yeah, and I'm looking forward to next um, translating the pathways to liberation matrix in Gujarati. So that's me. Yeah. <laughs> And I'd love to hear from Cory. <clears throat> Hello. Um, I'm in uh, California, San Diego. That's a picture of the beach near my home. And it's very, very hot here now with high humidity. So I am not wearing much clothing. And that's why I'm not on the screen right now, because it's too hot to wear clothing. And um, but I'll turn it on as it cools down. <laughs> and um, something about me, I love animals. I'm hearing people talk about animals. I also love dancing. 
In my area, um, in different parts of the United States, one of the beautiful butterflies called the monarch, it's a big orange butterfly, is close to extinction. And um, part of the pathway from Mexico through, they, one year they came right down my street for about four days, the butterflies that were migrating north. And it was like a spiritual experience. And um, they were like thousands and thousands of butterflies. And they were just choosing my street as one of their routes. And it went on for days. I could just get chills thinking about it. And so I'm looking into what kind of plants to put in my gardens to help draw and help the monarch butterfly continue. So that's a little bit about me. Thanks, Corey. And um, maybe we'll go to um, um, you, May, next. Hi, I'm you, May, in Taiwan. And today's topic about information violence reminds me uh, uh, experience of this information violence. Uh, it's about 10 years ago. Uh, in that time, I'm uh, working in an organization. I'm a trainer of creativity. And uh, there's uh, someone, uh, he put uh, information, not name, not name my name. Uh, he just said, uh, it's an in-house, in-house, uh, uh, and uh, like the share, they can free share the information. Uh, uh, this man uh, mentioned, there's a trainer. Uh, she, she's, she said that she's, uh, she's very experienced in the creativity, but uh, she doesn't have any patterns. And, uh, but I don't know what her, what he exactly saying in the course. And uh, my, uh, my department, my, my colleagues, I'm working in the creativity lab in the, in the organization. And uh, they told me, I, I'm not really seeing the, the, the information, but um, they all know this person is, uh, uh, saying about me because I'm only one uh, trainer in uh, this okay, in this organization and uh, I, when I heard this information I feel very hard hurt I feel hurt and uh, yeah it's some of the, my pain in my in my heart and uh, and uh, finally uh, I know uh, these people, uh, this man, uh, what he's saying, because uh, normally I'm, uh, uh, if you, uh, I'm trying, or I pre prefer to use this analog or abstract uh, information in the MBTI and the EMFP. So this M parts make me uh, sometimes uh, I say a lot of concept and the people with S, the sensing will know, it will not know uh, what I'm saying. So I know what's happened and, uh, but I can do it because I just, that's just me in that situation, but I feel, feel very hurt. I feel hurt. So that's important, uh, that's, that's experience. Uh, now I'm thinking about information violence. And since then, I told myself, never, never use any uh, uh, like this kind of violent uh, information or to the others, because it's really hard. That's my piece of information. Wow. Thank you, Yume. Winnie, and then we'll finish with Jen. Winnie? Hello, everyone. And my name is Winnie, and I'm from China. 
uh, it's autumn here and weather is weather uh, very cool um, and now I'm a little nervous and um, yeah my spoken English is not very good and uh, I'm I'm very uh, uh, I'm focusing on the words on the screen and uh, try my best to translate uh, into Chinese and uh, get the meaning what uh, what you say. Uh, when I received uh, the email from Jim, uh, I was very happy and uh, I want to join this meeting at this time. And before the meeting, uh, I took a long and deep breath and just for relaxation. Uh, and now um, a little nervous, but uh, just a little. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm very happy. And just uh, you may say uh, the violence. Uh, violence. Uh, actually, I don't know the topic uh, this time. Uh, and when you may say, I, I, I think the uh, su suggestion is also the um, wireless words and uh, always I, I did uh, uh, and and uh, at this time uh, I uh, uh, I I try my best to uh, uh, give myself uh, a space in my heart and uh, uh, think uh, what what the suggestion and the su suggestion is and uh, what the needs uh, of others. Yeah. Uh, uh, so much for this and thank you. <laughs> thank you, Winnie. I'm very impressed with how well you speak English uh, compared to five years ago when I first met you. you have, your, your English has improved a lot more than my Chinese has. Uh, Jen, we'll finish up with you. Yes, thank you. I am feeling... Hmm. Yeah, I guess there's so, some warmth. Um, yeah, warmth for noticing, yeah, how many people, English is their second language and feeling warm about that. And it also leads to a feeling like awe and wonder, but an extra bit of, oh, where's my list? <laughs> yeah, it's almost um, like a deep appreciation for being able to, to be at something so important and meaningful to myself and others that it's worth learning in a different language and then translating to the share. Yeah, I feel tenderness about that in a good way. And um, yeah, and something about the piece of information about me. Yeah, I have a daughter named Gwendolyn and um, for short, Winnie is Gwendolyn. Yeah, Winnie is Gwendolyn for short. So I just wanted to, that's my information. Thank you. Wow. That's a, something I didn't know about you. Thank you. Wow. Well, it looks like you could all uh, fulfill my request, which was to, uh, oops, a little bit too soon there, um, which was to, um, be able to give me a piece of information and because that's going to be a lot of what we talk about today and but let's just start by seeing if we know what we mean when we say it so just take a couple of minutes and uh, see if you can write down your own definition for information what is information mean to you
like to put your answer in the chat, that'd be cool. Or if you want to raise your hand and say it out loud, that's also cool. What is information? Information can be the piece of the puzzle that helps you move a project forward once you get it. Yeah. But what's it? I love that answer. And I wonder what the it is. What, what makes it information? When he says observation without feelings. Data based on, Arena says, da data based on facts or research. Tomomi says, I came up with two categories and there can be more core the message. I want to deliver something useful, data. Describes, names, labels, identify, uh, Jen says, describes, names, labels, identifies, contributes to wholeness, and being known, something connected to me, an organization or thing. Inform uh, Corey says, information can be personal as we shared, it can be objective like clear observations experienced by our senses. Yeah. So what happened or what's happening? Yeah. Y'all's definitions uh, have a lot to do, uh, have a lot in common with mine. Oops, wrong button. Try that again. So I, I, I went to the dictionary, I cheated. I looked at the dictionary and I'll tell you what my answer was in just a second. But I like this, that which resolves uncertainty. So it's something that resolves uncertainty. And uh, I don't know if you guys know what Wordle is. Wordle is this game, uh, word game. And um, so we've learned a lot about information and information theory by playing this game because Whenever you make a guess, you do a little, uh, every time you make a guess, you are both giving and receiving information and you become more and more certain about what the only answer might be to the puzzle. Then the other part of the definition is things that are known or can be known about a given topic. I think this very much relates to what uh, Julia wrote that sometimes you find out something about a given topic that makes all the difference. And that's a very important piece of information. And for me, it's also related to uh, observation. Uh, information and observation might even be the same thing. I'm not totally sure about that, <clears throat> but maybe. So here's my definite, my NBC definition of uh, observation. This comes from a handout that Joy and I designed, ooh, maybe 15, 17 years ago. <clears throat> and it's all based on quotes from um, Marshall Rosenberg's book, <clears throat> Language of Life. Almost all of it. The first thing is something that I added. Uh, direct sensory and cognitive experience. That's like my own personal definition. It's direct sensory and cognitive experience. And what I mean by that it's something that um, I can um, see with my own eyes or process with my own brain. That's what an observation is. It requires my, my being uh, to, to be with an experience that I have. So an, an observation, is, as this is Marshall now, a description of what's actually happening as reported by our five senses, plus our inner senses like the voice that we have in our head, any images that we have, thoughts, memories, and so forth. <clears throat> and observations by their nature 
in MVC terms are specific to time and context. Specific to time and context. So even though I might observe it now, I don't necessarily assume that it's always been that way or always will be that way. And for me, um, an example of that is that a, a, a true observation contains an, att uh, an attribution. Attribution just means a source. So for example, um, uh, I read in, um, oh, I heard from Jen today that her daughter's nickname is Winnie. And that it was the nickname for the name Gwendolyn. So I heard that from Jen is the, is the um, attribution or the source. The reason that's important is because then I have the chance or you have the chance if I say that you have the chance to go ask Jen. You know, did you tell Jim that your daughter's nickname was Winnie? And so she can either confirm um, my claim or not. So also um, another example of, uh, of an attribution would be, um, I saw a man in the park um, talking to a woman in a voice that scared me. So I saw it, I heard it, I'm, I'm taking responsibility for it. <clears throat> and if I really wanted to be clear, I saw this yesterday or I saw it five minutes ago or whatever. Marshall um, says that uh, he paraphrased Krishnamurti that the, the ability to make an observation is the highest form of human intelligence. That it's free of judgment, criticism, or other forms of analysis. It's the stimulus of our experience. And then I added this piece related to the first part. It's evidence of objective truth. An objective truth is a, is a technical term from philosophy, um, uh, which basically means that it's something that would be true whether there were human beings or not, like the existence of gravity or gravitational waves or um, photons or electrons or things that are of science. It doesn't matter whether we discovered them or not, they still exist. It doesn't matter whether we believe in them or not, they still exist. So that's what makes them objective. And uh, if we stick with observation, NVC teaches us that we, it, it can be helpful in terms of building a bridge of connection. And then we always, you know, all these key distinctions are on the one hand and on the other hand. So the other part of the distinction is usually something about evaluation or observation mixed with evaluation. So it's things that observations are not. So things like opinions, beliefs, values, needs. Yeah, even needs are evaluations. So once I was at a workshop with Marshall and and he said something like, how many of you are here at this workshop because you're hopeful that I will teach you how to stop judging? Everybody raised their hand, of course. That's what, what we thought NBC was. And he said, well, I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint you because I'm here to teach you how to be a more effective judge. In other words, by moving from opinions and beliefs into values or needs, we can become more um, effective in our judgments in terms of if, if by effective, we mean uh, contribute to connection. So an evaluation is simply a moral or a value judgment about what's actually, actually about happening. The observation is what's happening and then we judge it. We either judge it as right or wrong or whether or not it contributes to, to life or not. Whether we're making a moral judgment or a value judgment, we evaluate it. So it's how we make meaning of our own direct experience. 
sometimes it can be a tragic expression of human intelligence. We are really, really clever, we human beings. And that's what we're going to be looking at today is the tragic expression of human intelligence in the form of, of um, information warfare, for lack of a better term. And uh, evaluation contains, judge, contains moral judgments sometimes, value judgments sometimes, can contain criticism or other forms of an analysis. And it's less likely to build a bridge of connection than observation. And who has a guess of why I would say that? Why, why do we, in NBC, why do we say that uh, evaluation can get in the way of connection? Anybody got any? experiences about that or any guesses? Why are evaluations more likely to lead to disconnection? Than observations. Vega? Um, yeah. Because it's a static and it's also one point of the time. It can be static. It can be it can be attached to, to one one point. Yes, Arena. Uh, because with when we evaluate, uh, we move into the space of right wrong thinking, and uh, uh, as Vega said, we also believe our uh, understanding is the truth. Yeah. So it it doesn't keeps. It doesn't hold space for others yeah. yeah, and separates us. Yeah. It can, it certainly can. And the, th the thing that really that I notice about uh, mixing up observation with observation mixed with evaluation is it's likely to stimulate um, reaction in the other person. So if I, especially if I'm making an evaluation about them, you're lazy. You didn't do your homework. You're you're terrible at doing the dishes. You know we're we're really likely to move into um, to fight fight or flight when we hear stuff like that. So now let's think about misinformation. This might be a new term for you, but maybe not. Not these days. We're kind of learning a lot about this kind of stuff. How would you define misinformation? Rena says, uh, any information that is shared with a purpose to manipulate and it's incomplete or untrue. So I'll just pause here and just clarify that um, there's a distinction that um, is between misinformation and disinformation. These two words are often used um, 
uh, as synonyms, but they're different. And I'll tell you what the difference is in just a second. Um, misinformation versus disinformation. And Tomomi says something that isn't observation fact, something that is mixed with evaluation, something is not needs judgment, needs are true for that particular person. That's getting very, very close to, um, to, to um, it, it's really simple. It's incorrect information. That's all it means. Whenever you see the word miss in front of a word, uh, another word in English, and also probably uh, other uh, languages that are uh, Germanic or um, proto in, in proto Sanskrit. <laughs> we use a lot of the same um, <clears throat> same prefixes and suffix suffixes. Uh, it just means incorrect. So, for example, if I'm an NBC trainer and I stand in front of the room, like many NBC trainers, and I say the following, it's misinformation. The giraffe has the largest heart of any land mammal. How many times have you heard that in NBC? Marshall said it 10 million times. It's misinformation. When Marshall said it, it was information. Now it's misinformation because the science has evolved since the 1960s or 70s or whenever Marshall started talking about giraffes. Or maybe Marshall heard it from somebody and it sounded cool. And so he just took it on might, somebody else might have given him some incorrect information, but um, it's clear that uh, rhinoceros rhinoceroses, elephants, and hippopotamuses all have larger hearts than giraffes. And what you could say that would be information is that um, if you're measuring blood pressure, giraffes have the strongest hearts of any land mammals. I actually like that better than biggest. So that's what I say in my trainings, because uh, it's information rather than misinformation. It's actually correct. And sometimes misinformation is misleading. And that has to do sometimes in the way with where a newspaper story is shared because of the bias of the writer or the editor. They may be giving you um, uh, misleading information um, happens, you know, all you got to do is watch TV and see how, uh, in, how uh, at least American TV, uh, often the police are shown trying to mislead suspects that they're investigating by telling them things that aren't true. They're trying to mislead the, um, the suspect in a crime into confessing. So that's what misinformation means. And then there's this piece here, disinformation. This is a relatively new concept. Whenever you um, see the, the prefix DIS in front of a word, it usually points to something um, um, toxic like disease or um, something that can be poisonous, like a disinfectant is something to get rid of an infection it means to, you know, basically it implies uh, in this case with this information, uh, the first time that we know of that the word was used was in, uh, the, by the Russians, <clears throat> the Soviets specifically, the Soviet Union back in the 1920s or something like that. They actually created a, a bureau uh, in one of their spy organizations called the Bureau of Disinformation. And their mission was actually to uh, use false information, misinformation in other words, to deliberately spread lies and to deceive people. So it's, it's false information deliberately spread to deceive people. Now, you can see that this is, this, we have a little bit of trouble here with this being an NBC-based uh, definition because it, re it requires us to know the uh, intent of the person that we're, um, that we're talking about. Um, so I, I hold this, I, I haven't figured out a completely clear way of expressing this as an observation yet. 
because I'd have to hear from the other person that they were deliberately trying to deceive people. Sometimes we have to in, induce that or uh, make a, a guess about that because they won't tell us. So <clears throat> both misinformation and disinformation confuses and conflates observation with evaluation. So what I mean by confusing, this is the word that Marshall would use. If we confuse observation with observation mixed with evaluation, it's likely that it's because we just don't, we don't understand the distinction. We're confused and it might lead to confusion for somebody else. <clears throat> Conflation means that we are intentionally trying to make two things the same that aren't the same. That's going to become clearer in a few minutes. But conflation just means that we are confusing two completely distinct ideas. Like the, 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 the saddest story that I can think of is my, uh, my father. Uh, when he was um, when he was in his last months of life, uh, I didn't know it at the time, but it was his last month, and I was visiting him in uh, in his home, and he was in his mid to late eighties, and his his mind had begun to uh, slip into um, some mild dementia, <clears throat> and. Uh, one day he, he looked around the room that we were all sitting in, the room that he'd lived in for the last 40 years. And he said uh, that he couldn't believe that um, uh, something about this room um, because he was just amazed that this piece of furniture was here because he thought that was in Alabama, the state next door. And so he was conflating two different realities in his brain. He was, he was conflating a memory with the actual room that we were in. And so that happens to all of us, we, we, we conflate. So just pause here and see if there's any questions or comments about information, misinformation or disinformation. Uh, yeah. I was um, noticing that um, misinformation, uh, the, 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 the key point about disinformation is our curiosity around the intention. Yeah. Is that a misinformation is incomplete or, or incorrect exactly. information? Exactly. Okay. That disinformation is um, intentional. Yeah. Mm. There's some great examples of that going on in the world right now, which we're going to talk about. <laughs> Vega, did you have something? Also in corporates. Also in corporates where information is privilege. Yes. Yeah. And then, and then there's a whole game around that yeah. disinformation. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like... Mm. Uh, like um, well, I won't go down that road. Might take us too 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 far down a rabbit hole. Uh, Vega, did you want to say something? Yes. So for me, first, uh, this uh, I was thinking about observation and evaluation. So that thoughts, what I think, can be an observation when I say I think this, 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 and evaluation is I speak as a static sentence. And about disinformation, I was considering that uh, to deceive people, and I was thinking maybe they really believe that some people, or they even conf feel confused, or <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I was uh, thinking. Thank you. Know, you. Thank you for bringing this point of clarity. So if someone gives, uh, let's say, um, uh, uh, how do I say it? So it's as observationally as possible. Um, if someone reports 
something that they believe to be true that isn't true, but they think it's true, that's misinformation. If somebody reports something that they know not to be true, trying to get you to believe something you don't believe, that's disinformation. So it has to do with intent. There's needs behind both. One, I'm just, I'm just, uh, my need, uh, I don't even know I have the need for clarity. You know, like uh, if I say, um, giraffes have the largest heart of any land mammal. I might truly believe that to be true. And I tell you, I used to tell it to my students all the time until somebody brought it up in a Marshall Rosenberg work workshop and challenged Marshall on it. So I did the research myself and uh, learned, learned the current reality. But that person, Marshall, I am totally convinced that he believed it to be true. He was not mis he was missing misinforming us, not disinforming us. Thank you for the clarity. <laughs> yes, I've been so enjoying doing the research for this class because I have learned a lot. That's why I love to, to teach it's because I always teach something I don't know. And then I end up sounding like an expert when I'm really <laughs> not because I just, just love learning. Okay. Anybody else? Can I, I, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I have, um, I'm, I'm forming an understanding uh, as, as we, as we speak on the topic, um, also about the disinformation. So you would say that someone uh, has the intention to make you knows the information is not true, but will tell you it is true with the idea of, in a way, manipulating. And yeah, and also knowing and we see this can be a bit uh, tricky, like, but no, we say they're all only good intentions and only good needs and I'm, I'm understand I think there are so many layers and the, the bottom of it is there are only good intentions and needs that we try to fulfill um, but every everything about like there are more superficial layers where they can be the bad intention of disinforming I, I don't know I'm trying to yeah express it but i'm forming it at the same time as i'm speaking yeah. but I, I, do you understand what i'm trying I to say i think i've got it and so um let me make a, dis a distinction between uh intention and uh um a need okay <clears throat> so um because i think intentions can be either negative or positive right so if if I if I intend uh, to uh, hurt you, I would call that a negative intention, even though it might be coming from a need. You know, which, which Marshall called it a tragic expression of an unmet need, but but it would still be uh, negative. Would mean it would be harmful. A negative intention would be something that caused harm. Would be how I would look at it. And but even even if I were to like hit my kid to discipline them. Um, I would call that um, uh, um, that there's a need. It's harmful in my current belief system, uh, but um, I can see that the need that I was trying to meet when I hit my kid was to uh, create order or safety or something like that. So it's still driven by a need. Um, and it's... Um, it may not have, uh, I may not have a positive intention. I have lied in my life. And I have, sometimes I have, I've lied in order to protect somebody. I call that a positive intention. And sometimes I've lied in order to deceive somebody in order to protect myself. So the need was the same, but in one, I was trying to avoid punishment. You know, I was, I was lying so that I didn't get caught cheating or whatever it was that I was doing as a child, um, stealing something or something like that. Uh, so I was trying to protect myself, but I was trying to deceive the other person. I wanted them to think somebody else mm -hmm. did it or something like that. So my intention was to try to, to get somebody else in trouble rather than me. 
but my need was still protection. Mm-hmm. This mm-hmm. wasn't it was obnoxious giraffe, as Marshall called it. I only cared about my needs. I didn't care about the other kid that mm-hmm. I was trying to shift. Mm-hmm. The one what I hear is one is more self uh, towards your self interests, and the other is taking into account uh, the yeah. other needs as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That that's helpful. Uh, Jim, I'm I'm in touch with this that when I need to protect myself and I lie, I don't want to hurt the other person, but I regret that it's going to hurt the other person or may that may cause harm. Yeah. And I hope I hope it doesn't. Yeah. But the main thing is I I want to protect myself. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're just a little more enlightened to me, than me, because sometimes I think I have lied with the intention of, of actually doing harm, not so much in the last, uh, not in my adult years, but as a child, I would, I would, uh, I had enemies as a child. I don't have enemies anymore. Oh, wow. But an enemy is somebody that you want to harm. And, and they, I would have thought children don't have enemies and we have enemies when we grow up. Oh well, so, yeah, it's interesting. We get it. We get it. So we get we we start worshiping violence at a very young age in the West, you know. So um, we just we just have a steady diet of of violence that we're fed and right wrong. I mean, we we get it probably way more than than other places in the world. So I suffered from that. I want to keep going here, unless there's something that someone's burning to say. Um, oh, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Ah, yeah, yeah. No, I wanted to say because when I see this uh, definition of to deceive people, and I was feeling actually very sad. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there was a uh, part don't want to believe that. Yeah. And then when I change it into, yeah, that needs what Julia was asking, and. Um, I was thinking, okay, so they want to achieve their goal and somehow it softened my heart, yeah. but it can be also not only their consideration of their need because where I live, it's happening, they are doing for the community. So, yeah. Yeah, so they're contributing to, um, uh, um, more, to my understanding, Marshall kind of um, um, combined all those we needs into one word, well-being. So, you know, when, when I think of well-being, it's that I'm not just connected to my needs anymore. I'm actually living in, with the understanding that my needs are not met if your needs are not met. So I can see how my need for well-being might sometimes be tragically expressed through misinformation or disinformation, which are both strategies, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So um, we live in a world of um, where we have access to more data than ever before. The number of pages on the internet is doubling, I don't know, maybe every week or something like that. I don't even know what the number is, but it, we, are, we have access to so much information, some of which is, inform- and we also have access to misinformation and disinformation. And so, what has happened, like uh, in in the in the current um, age here in the United States, we have this this phenomenon called QAnon. Some of you probably have heard about it, <clears throat> but the QAnon is this uh, rather um, uh, strong uh, right wing um, view uh, that has a, a lot of beliefs uh, that. Um, that are expressed uh, by politicians and so forth. And the main strategy 
that people have used to try to counteract things like um, QAnon or um, things like it is something called debunking. So bunk, <laughs> bunk means uh, lies. It's just another word for lies. Um, and so debunking would be somebody gives you a piece of misinformation or disinformation, and then you go and you try to prove or show the real truth. So if somebody says um, um, giraffes have the largest heart of any land mammal, and you you heard uh, Jim say that that wasn't true, and then you looked it up on your own, and then you became clear that um, elephants had larger hearts than giraffes, and then some other human being said that giraffes had the largest land uh, largest heart of any land mammal. You could say, well, according to, and then you provide your observation. Um, giraffes don't have the largest heart. Hippopotamuses do, or elephants do, or whatever it is. And so that's debunking. So now if I'm attached to my belief about giraffes having the largest heart of any land mammal, and you debunk me, especially in a public place, what's the reaction that you predict is going to happen in me? Are you going to convince me that I'm wrong? No, Julia is shaking her head. She's tried this, so have I. No, what you get is resistance. You get someone who, um, who, um, who then thinks that not only are you trying to prove them wrong, but you must be part of the conspiracy. You must be the bad guy. You must be the enemy because you're trying to debunk me. So this has had really tragic effects in the United States <clears throat> because um, of this polarity of political opinion <coughs> that has happened over the last 20, 30 years, magnified over the last five years. And so families have become extremely divided by having uh, debunking conversations. So Uncle Fred will say that, um, will make some kind of a claim about um, you know um, pedophiles running the government or something like that, and then um, nephew Bill says, "Oh, uncle, uncle, that's crazy. Look here, let me show you this data." And uncle of, uh, then has an enemy image not uh, of his nephew, and the nephew wants to fight, and so it leads to information warfare. If 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 I try to provide observations to counteract um bunk i'm not going to get anywhere so debunking fights facts with fights with facts <coughs> anybody want to say anything about that yeah jim so yeah even as, as a yeah that is something i find myself doing on a daily basis even when I know better and want to use NBC and find people's needs. It's just so hair trigger to hear someone's misinformation and just want to fix it so they don't think and feel that way. And then there's no problem. Yes. Yeah. And it does not work. I, I argue with it's, it's kind of sad. Like I'll argue with my 75 year old friend who really could use some company. Yeah. And we spend our time arguing about jen being right <laughs> yes yes and it there it is it's, it's painful and i guess there's i'm sharing too that i don't know it's a bigger solution thing problem like there's something deeper underneath yeah 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 i i really catch that this is painful for you and that you acknowledge that you see this pattern in you this uh this debunking um strategy and that it leads to separateness from someone that that you care about yeah and i even have like this little i call it the rabid tasmanian devil <laughs> sitting here trying to help me remember not to do it and it doesn't always help 
Ja. 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 En Winnie, were you going to say something? Ja, yeah, I want to say something about um, between the information and the banking, okay? And yeah, uh, I, I think the misinformation uh, just uh, the um, uh, sorry, wait, wait, wait. yeah, uh, the misinformation uh, just um, uh, a wrong message, uh, maybe. Uh, the the people who said the misinformation that he didn't know that it was wrong, uh, and but the disinformation, uh, when the people said the disinformation. I think uh, he is a liar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, maybe um, maybe the he he already got it was wrong, but he still. Uh, insist on and uh, the disinformation maybe uh, is a strategy for him and uh, then then uh, when we want to debunk debunk the disinformation and uh, we can uh, make a pre-bunking yeah uh to uh yeah yeah <laughs> so much for this and yes yes that, that is my my own words yeah yes thank you we haven't really got to the pre-bunking yet but the 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 cure for getting us out of the debunking is empathy so if i'm involved uh i have friends people that i care a lot about that have that have um, um, they they seem to believe things that don't seem to be true to me, and rather than fight with them, which is what I was doing like early in the pandemic or other places in the political life, rather than me trying to convince them that they were wrong and I was right, now I just empathize with them, and I ask them questions. So. Somebody tells me that, um, so Jen, you be the 75 year old friend of yours and tell me something that he or she might okay, say. Okay, yeah. Yeah. All right. So, um, yeah, Trudeau is a communist. And if you don't start standing up for your rights, Jen, do you want to be a communist? Do you want to live in a communist country? Yeah, so it sounds like communism is really scary for you. Yeah, and I see you just out in La La Land, um, thinking that people shouldn't be fighting and um, wasting all our time and money. But yeah, somebody has to. Yeah, yeah. You're really concerned about my well being and also the well being of the country. Mm hmm. Hold on, I, I feel some softening. I gotta, yeah, but what is there is still something. Actually, yeah, I think she would potentially break down and have some, like, yeah, that emotion. And she needs to be heard in that, is what I'm getting, Jim. Thank you. Yeah. 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 And I'm not doing a great job. <laughs> and I From get to on, practice. Now on. I get to keep practicing. I get to keep practicing. From now on. Yeah. I had a friend um, who, um, who uh, I was connecting with on a regular basis because they were uh, working on integrating NBC. So they're like a coaching client. <clears throat> and um, they started watching videos. And uh, though one night um, that person started watching um, some uh, pretty terrible examples, in my opinion, of disinformation and she watched him for like six hours straight. And she emerged on the other end with um, a complete belief uh, in the QAnon conspiracy. <clears throat> and uh, then she gently started trying to convince me that I was wrong. 
And so I, I did a pretty good job of sticking with empathy, but not perfect. Uh, because I would say, I would also go use my honesty. And I, I would empathize first, then I'd say, I really catch that you really believe this. I don't believe it. It doesn't make any sense to me. And so we managed to stay connected, even though I wasn't perfectly in empathy. And even though I uh, expressed my disagreement, because I was committed to the friendship, I was committed to the zero step to connecting. It didn't really matter to me whether they ever changed their mind. I preferred that they changed their mind. And as time went by, because of the love and the support and the empathy in, in their community, they found their own way back without anybody debunking anything. They debunked that for themselves because of the empathy they got. I think that's the only, one of the only strategies. When somebody has already gone down that road, yeah. empathy, empathy, empathy. That's empathy and love. Right, and another thing I do that's not quite debunking, but it's probably almost as bad as I tell her, if you watch that, more of that's gonna keep coming up. Yeah. yeah. Which is an observation, that's right. true. You're actually, uh, uh, um, saying some information that's pretty reliable. That if you continue, if you reinforce what you already believe, you'll 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 believe it more deeply. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Thank you, Jim. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, well, now let's talk about some recent research, which is what stimulated this whole class today. <laughs> Get so excited about this. So pre-bunking. Pre-bunking. Or is that that um, that's that uh, prefix in English? Pre always refers to coming before. So before you bunk or debunk, you do something else, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And this is how you can wage peace through education. So this is work. This is work that was done by the University of Cambridge and the University of Bristol. You'll get a copy of all these slides, so you don't have to worry about trying to write this down. And they came up with something called um, inoculation science. So inoculation, of course, is um, means you use um, a, a little bit of something to have a big effect, like a, a vaccination is a form of inoculation. So in this case, we're trying to inoculate <clears throat> against um, the equivalent of a thought virus or disinformation. And so what, what, what they did is they did a study, they've done several now, <coughs> that um, they, they exposed uh, people on YouTube specifically to uh, brief videos uh, that showed how misinformation and disinformation is used to promote uh, falsehoods. And um, so they did this on YouTube and they found out that it had a, a measurable effect in reducing the, um, uh, the um, tendency for people to believe <clears throat> disinformation. Uh, of course, it didn't work on everybody, nothing does, but it had a measurable effect and so now they're starting to do more research along with Google <coughs> and maybe some other social media companies to um, demonstrate how learning a little bit about the techniques of disinformation can awaken people so that they don't fall for it anymore. So let's watch an example of one of these. You might think about skipping this ad. Don't. What happens next will make you tear up. Wait, you're still here? I mean, great, looks like the trick worked. You see, when watching videos or browsing online, you are likely to encounter content that is loaded with emotional language and with good reason. Playing into emotions, especially negative ones, such as fear, anger, or contempt, is a trick to get you to pay attention to something when you otherwise wouldn't. It's likely that's a big reason why you're still watching this ad is because you were lured in by our use of emotional language in the very first sentence. 
Research has shown that expressing emotion is key for the spread of moral and especially political ideas in social networks. So let's say when you're writing a headline and you're trying your hardest to manipulate your readers to click, one thing you can do is pepper your headlines with a bunch of emotionally charged words. Call it a horrific accident instead of a serious one, a disgusting ruling instead of a disagreeable one, or a heartbreaking twist of faith instead of an unfortunate coincidence. That way, you're likely to reach more people and influence the reactions. So let's see how this plays out in real life. Let's take the following headline from the movie Anchorman. No emotional manipulation at play here, just to the point, no nonsense coverage of such an important event in history. So when it says, if you can't read it, it says, uh, Ron Burgundy finished second in hot dog eating contest. Ron Burgundy is a fictional character in a movie. And it just says he finished second in a hot dog eating contest. This headline, on the other hand, see what they did there? The this one says, the mutants are revolting, both kinds of revolting. Wider used an emotionally charged word like revolting to describe a whole group of people. Are mutants people? Oh, well, you get the point. They're fear mongering. So whenever you feel outraged or angry, remember, someone may be pulling your strings. Don't be manipulated. Truth Labs, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. That was about a minute long, one minute and uh, 45 seconds long. And they put this into the YouTube algorithm so that um, it would randomly go to people and then they studied um, uh, they they youtube knows so much about you <laughs> they get they took the people who watched this little thing for at least 30 seconds they didn't even necessarily watch till the end and then they did a follow-up survey with them to find out what the effect was and they found out that it had this inoculation effect that when these people were exposed to emotionally laden headlines in YouTube videos, they were less likely to watch them or believe them. So the takeaway for me is, hey man, I've got, I've got the support of NBC, right? If I see an evaluation in a headline I already know that I, I've, I've already been pre-bunked by NBC. I already know what's coming next is going to be likely to be no longer an observation. If they use really strong, emotionally laden language in the headline, I already know they're trying to manipulate me. Whereas if they use uh, a headline that does not have emotionally laden terms, I'm much more likely to get curious about what goes on. Anybody have anything to say about this one? I'll give you links to all these videos, by the way. There's six of them that maybe we'll watch. Go ahead, Tomomi. I have a question. Is that uh, when you put the title for this session, did you consider not putting the emotional language? Yeah, good point. I said... Um, <laughs> I said something like, um, my title was um, From Information Warfare to Information Peacemaking. Yeah. yeah. I couldn't guess what it can be, or, you know, there's no, not much information. <laughs> yeah. 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 I see your point. Me. You know, yeah. when, when I do marketing, I mean, the marketers use the same techniques as disinformation export experts, right? We try to, uh, when we're doing marketing, we try to get to, we try to speak to people's emotions because <clears throat> all the studies, all the social psychology studies point to that we, as much as we think we're rational, that we use this part of our brain to make rational decisions, we don't. We use our gut. Mm. You know, nobody needs a Coca-Cola, but yet we think it's a need. Nobody needs a diamond ring. Nobody needs a new car. Nobody needs all the things that are 
are full of, uh, ads are full of because emotional language um, helps us to confuse a need with a strategy. Yeah. Does that make sense, Tomomi? Yes, it does. Thank you. I just needed to ask. Thank you. Yeah, so guilty is charged. Okay, let's watch another one. If you're if you like. This one the screen's bigger, so it'll be easier to see. Groundbreaking new research shows that anybody who closes a video ad within the first five seconds is most likely to watch online advertising all the way through. Go on, think about that totally coherent statement for just a couple of seconds. Incoherence. Now, the quality being illogical or inconsistent, if your goal is to defend a position at all costs, it doesn't really matter whether your reasons for doing so form the coherent whole, because most people won't notice anyway. It's much easier to use the most convenient argument at hand, even if this argument and a different argument you made earlier cannot both be true at the same time. It's useful to be on the lookout for such incoherent arguments. Being incoherent means being wrong. The earth cannot be flat and round. If someone is using both arguments at different times, they are the ones who are confused, not you. Incoherence can be difficult to spot in real time, as people often don't make incoherent arguments in the same sentence. But let's see what the truth o matic has to say. Pull the lever, Crunk! Well, that looks exactly like my old space. Yeah, but this one comes with your own company suck-up. Morning, Mr. Griffin. Nice day. Yeah, it's a little cloudy. It's absolutely cloudy. One of the worst days I've seen in years. So, good news about the Yankees. I hate the Yankees. Pack of cheaters. That's what they are. I love your tie. I hate this tie. It's awful. It's gaudy. It's gotta go. So whenever you see contradictions like this, the argument is most likely incoherent. Truth Labs. Keep coherent and carry on. So incoherence, things that can't both be true. So I'm inoculating you all, do you realize this, of course, that you every time now you look at a social media post or a YouTube video or a headline, you're going to be much more likely to be alert to incoherence, to two things that, are, that both can't be true takes practice to really see it. <clears throat> Jim, do you have a common example of something in NBC land trainings that has that? I hope not. Um, uh, like maybe not intentionally. Um, I'll have to think about that, Jim, let's see. You know, the, the easiest way to see incoherence is to watch any speech by Donald Trump. Donald Trump is a master of incoherence. In the same sentence, he will say the two, opp two opposite things. People think that, some people claim that he's not smart. He's extremely smart. He's an extremely powerful communicator. But in the same sentence, and I didn't do the research to find a specific example, but in the same sentence, um, you can pretty much pull out any speech he's ever made, and you'll find an example of incoherence, usually in the same sentence. And the result is, <clears throat> uh, it'll play to anybody's bias. So if, if my brain is paying attention to a Donald Trump or some other politician, and they say incoherent things, my brain only remembers the part that I agree with. But somebody else standing right next to me who might have the opposite beliefs, they hear only the part that they agree with. And so they both of us end up liking this politician, even though we may have believed the exact opposite thing because we've become basically hypnotized in a way, it's like a metaphor, uh, because of the incoherence. These two things can't both be true, but we only hear because of our own bias, we only hear what we want to hear. 
This isn't just something that happens on the right wing, happens in the, in the, amongst the, the so-called left wing as well. So it doesn't matter what your politics are, we can all be um, manipulated by disinformation. Jim, could I share something? Please. Yeah, I appreciate this. I, I, it's slightly different, I think, but it kind of fits in the category, I think. I don't think it's uh, exactly incoherent, but it's where I, I think I've got really confused and other people have told me they're confused. So somebody asked her, um, I forgot who it was, about an NBC example. So one place, this might be an example where I might think it's incoherent. I don't think it is now, but I, um, so in, particularly in the beginning of my NBC journey many years ago, over, over 15 years ago, uh, around, this is around the topic of judgments, okay? So I, I would interpret or I might hear trainers say something like transform judgments into feelings in me. It's kind of a common phrase, transform, you know, that was the idea. Transform judgments, you know, don't just stay with judgments. And, and later on, as um, the MEC community was kind of getting more into mindfulness and kind of being with things, I started hearing things like um, embrace your judgments because judgments, you know, like have a hidden gift to lead us to our, our needs. But I didn't hear that in the beginning. And so if I put those two statements together, one is saying, transform your judgments. And the other one is saying, you know, like embrace it. And that to me seems, um, causes, um, you know, a disconnect. And does that make sense what I'm saying? Yes, it does. Yes, and it, it reminds me of something that you might hear from uh, a trainer that's less experienced because they it, it may be misinformation rather than disinformation, but they might say something like, um, 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 it's bad. Maybe they would do it in more NBC terms, but um, NBC teaches you not to have judgments now let's talk a little bit about how to judge more effectively. In a way, that could be seen as incoherent unless you're clear about the distinction between a moral judgment and a value judgment. So the coherence comes from the key distinction. But if you don't, if you don't, if if you don't, if you're not clear about expressing the key distinction of value judgment versus moral judgment, it looks really incoherent. Does that make sense? Yeah, I love, that makes sense. And I just want to add another sort of aspect that's related to that. It's slightly different, though. It's kind of like what, so I was just talking about moral judgments, not, you know, the other kind. Um, but what I got from hearing more or less transform judgments was like, in my own mind, because I live in a black and white culture, I'm thinking, okay, judgments are bad, you know, like we should get beyond judgments. And I felt embarrassed. Nobody was doing jackal, embracing the jackal in the early years. Yeah. We were doing stuff like that and very much. Yeah. And there was no like, listen to your jackal. Uh, that language wasn't even out there. Yeah. Marshall was doing this thing called go under your hat, which meant you would just sort of have a release of your jackals, but that wasn't even widely done. So yeah. um, my point is, I thought judgments were bad. I need to get past my judgments. I might be embarrassed if I share a judgment. And I worked really hard to, whenever I have a judgment, like that person isn't spiritual, let's say. Yeah. And then I would try to change it. Yeah. But now, but what, what I like so much better is this idea that even with moral judgments, I can... It can take me to my unmet needs. Yeah. And that's such a different way of looking at it. It's like, oh, invite your judgments. Yeah. You know, like, and then I heard late, much later that Marshall writes down his judgments every day. Yeah. He, and then later on, he will trans, you know, but again, in my mind, it was still like judgments are bad. Oh, there, there, there. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and now I'm like, I'm, I'm much more relaxed. I'm like, oh, a judgment. Interesting. Okay. You know? Yeah. And it's that's that's more like the welcoming. Oh, this is useful. Yeah, it's leading me to, to my unmet needs. So I, you, I, to me, that's big. Yeah. Yeah. For you now, a judgment is an invitation to connection rather than something to judge. 
morally. Yeah, like I'm, oh. like I'm not doing NBC, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so I think it created, um, it seemed like it was incoherent to put those two together for me. Yeah, great example. Thank you. Yeah, so let's look at another one. Let's see what you think of this one. Either you stop watching the lamestream media, or you want all puppies to die. Makes sense, right? No? Good, because it shouldn't. It's a common manipulation technique called a false dichotomy or a false dilemma. It's designed to make you think you only got two choices to choose from, when in reality, there are more. As with our little dilemma at the beginning, there's no reason why you can't watch mainstream media and want all puppies to live. The two don't rule each other out. And by presenting you with an option that is clearly undesirable and the option the manipulator wants you to pick, your choices are narrowed down for you. A famous example of a false dilemma is this one from Star Wars Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith. My allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy! If you're not with me, then you're my enemy. Anakin's claim that Obi-Wan is either with him or is his enemy is a clear case of false dichotomy. Obi-Wan is trying to prevent Anakin from joining the dark side, which naturally involves being critical of Anakin's choices. But just because Obi-Wan disagrees with Anakin doesn't automatically make them enemies. Obi-Wan's reply is actually perfect. Only a Sith deals in absolutes. Good old Obi! Be on the lookout for instances of false dichotomies in real life. They're more common than you think. Truth Labs, when things are too and why dare to be gray? Yeah, false dichotomies is what this one's called. And the clue from a language perspective is the word or. So whenever you hear the word or, a dilemma is being created. Sometimes it's a true dilemma. Do you want to go to eat pizza or do you want to go eat Chinese food tonight? That's a dilemma, but it's not. <laughs> It's not um, something that's going to cause, um, you know, a war to break out. <clears throat> For me, uh, um, and, uh, uh, hearing the word or uh, when I'm awake, when I'm truly in my NBC consciousness, whenever I hear the word or, the, f the next thought I have is, really? There's got to be at least one more choice. Because the universe, I don't, I want to transcend a scarce universe that only has two choices. And people who want to um, get your money or your brain or your eyeballs, they're going to use uh, false choices all the time to rile you up emotionally. I'll do one more. I know we're going through these fast, but I want you to get at least exposure to all of them. And then we can talk about it in the checkout. I just find this so fascinating. I'm so grateful that these people came up with this idea because I didn't know what else to do. Now, now I can always share these videos with somebody. You could share these videos with your 75 year old friend and and might stimulate an interesting conversation. Yes, so let me know all the places I do it. <laughs> yeah. If this ad fails to get enough views, I, your humble voiceover artist, will be fired. And it'll be because of ad skippers like you. <gasps> How could you? How am I gonna pay for Cujo's next pedicure? <laughs> Sorry, what I did to you there was take a complex problem, like how hard it is to get people to view ads, and singled out a specific group such as ad skippers as being entirely responsible. This is a common tactic called scapegoating. Wikipedia says it comes from the Bible. Of a pair of goats, one would be ritually sacrificed and the other, the scapegoat, would be released into the wilderness, metaphorically carrying with it people's transgressions and sins. Imagine there's an alien invasion. Some people might be tempted to use scapegoating to avoid being held responsible. But it's unlikely that a single individual, group, or goat is solely to blame. 
Here's an example of scapegoating from South Park, bigger, longer, and uncut. The children of South Park have started swearing prodigiously. In desperate need of someone or something to blame, the town's parent teacher association finds a scapegoat. <laughs> Times have changed! Our kids are getting worse! They won't obey their parents, they just want to fight and curse! Should we blame the government? Or blame society? Or should we blame the images on TV? No! Blame Canada! Blame Canada! For the beady little eyes and flapping heads are full of lies! Blame Canada! Blame Canada! We need to form a full assault! So if someone tries to make a complicated problem look simple by placing blame on a single group, they're most likely trying to manipulate you. True Labs! Blame is fine when it's fair. So obviously, blame scapegoating is a prime technique in disinformation warfare. If you uh, look at uh, any of the media around the Ukrainian disaster that's unfolding, uh, you can see it on both sides, but primarily, uh, at least in my opinion, you see a lot of it in Russia, Russian media, because the Russian media is controlled by the state. They only have one, one uh, point of view that they're trying to get across. And they blame the Ukrainians or they blame NATO or they blame America or they blame Biden. Blame, 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 blame. Ukrainians do it too. The Ukrainians are blaming the Russians. But anytime you see blame, for me, how I use it is, huh, empathy. I'm guessing you feel really angry. You really want justice or whatever the need is. You know, you really want support. You want something else. So when so I the invitation for me is to awaken to hear blame and then use it as the opportunity to create connection through listening for the feelings and needs underneath the blame. One more real quick and then we'll just pause and talk about it. Share the screen again. So he's done brilliantly. Play on, says the referee. No, it's going to be a penalty kick for the Italians. What an idiot. He should get his eyes checked. He's been bribed. He's been bought by the mafia. In sports, as in life, it's easy to get emotionally involved. But sadly, the Bad News Corp have taken things too far. Staff watching the game resorted to name-calling, accusations of bribery, and made jokes about the ref's heritage. This is a manipulation tactic known as an ad hominem attack, which means against the person in Latin. The reason that we refer to this tactic by its Latin name is probably because even as far back as ancient Rome, people were aware that attacking the questioner rather than the argument is unfair. Sometimes, of course, it is relevant to note someone's past experiences. Like imagine a tobacco company putting out a study saying that smoking can't cause you harm. Should we question the character and motive here? I think so. But instead of attributing blame in such a deserved way, sadly, ad hominem attacks are commonly used to draw attention away from the issue at hand and manipulate your impression of the person instead. I can't believe what I'm hearing. Well, then you better turn up your hearing aid, Pops. Pops? I'm only two years older than you. Do we want old man Patterson here with his finger on the button? What button? What the hell are you talking about? What, 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 which button? Where am I? Who took my false teeth? <laughs> You'll be surprised how often people attack a person or group rather than the argument itself. Truth Labs. Just because they get personal doesn't mean you have to. So obviously this too relates to NBC, right? This is diagnosis. You hear diagnosis happen all the time in social media. You hear name calling. You hear um, people being called uh, Nazis or fascists or communists or whatever you don't like. That's what you call the other person. And that's in order to rile up support for your position. So I wish we had about 20 more minutes. I'd love to put you in small groups to talk about this <clears throat> for a little while. 
but uh, we didn't we don't have time so let's just have one minute of silence let's do two minutes of silence while you just think about your takeaway for today and then we'll have a nice leisurely checkout maybe answer some questions two minutes So, two questions come up for me. You can, maybe we have time for both, but pick one that you want to answer the first time. You only have two choices. See, I'm doing it too. And if you don't do it, you're going to really disappoint me. There's another one. And it's all Jen's fault if you don't do what I, what I want you to do. Okay, so I'll see if I can build three of these right into one there. Now, the two, the two things that I'm most interested in are, um, what's your takeaway? What, what did you learn today? And the second one would be, how will you apply it in your life? What did you learn and, and or how will you apply it in your life? Rena, you want to go first this time? You feel ready? Yeah. I, I really um, enjoyed exploring observations and evaluations from this lens of information and debunking, pre-bunking, all these new words for me, disinformation. So, it, and I love key differentiation. So that that helps to kind of explore and also uh, catch them, you know, catch the nuances. Uh, so I love the framework. And how I would apply it is also to look at, um, you know, evaluations, uh, which are, you know, like, 
which are helpful in a sense of observations like thoughts or information that is like observation. So again, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with how I would apply it, but um, I guess in um, I'm, I'm watching a lot of news around a horrible takeover bid by this company in India, and they are taking over a TV, one of the free media, free journalism uh, corporations, NDTV. So I'm going to see how I can stay present without enemy images. I don't, it's painful, it's tiring oh. to keep on having enemy images come up. That's how I'm going to use this. Thank you. I look forward to checking in and finding out how that, how, if it helps you. Thank you, Rena. Jen, you feel ready to go next? Yes. So, yeah, thank you, Jim. I enjoyed it. And a takeaway for me, or some, a way I want to apply or use it, I was going to go look up what the word is, but the like the assumptions of NVC and things like the zero step, like that we want to, to come from a place of connection and holding all needs as valuable and important. That those are some of the pre-bunking things that like if I'm worried about this happening in NVC a little bit that those are, well, yeah, those things can be pre-bunking for everywhere and to help the blame and, and stuff be less powerful too but also i guess uh, something i'm leaving with is it does seem that we need to use some of these things in marketing i don't know if it's true for sure but if we come up with our own ways to appeal to emotion that um it's still the same thing we're still moving and persuading people so it's the integrity the other integrity parts of that to be providing value and I don't I don't know it's interesting it's hard for me because I notice myself getting put off really easy when I see these things in different ads and stuff or even scarcity thinking or fear and it does seem like the, that it's needed in order to get especially people that don't already know NBC to attract them to want to come and learn. So I'm not sure. Yeah. So there's a big question mark about that stuff. And I'm glad I have integrity to will help me along with that. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. I, I really like that you leave with a question and a wonder about that. Uh, you may, you ready? Okay, yes. Well, my takeaway is there some, the, the for me is uh, some words emerging uh, is important for me in this uh, core. The, the intention behind the uh, information, okay? And uh, uh, the second is the empathy. I'm the, uh, the others uh, who is disagree with me. And I always keep this con okay, connection with empathy. And, uh, and uh, I think that I, I can now to uh, more, more object, uh, objective to the, the headlines if they uh, involves the emotion words mm. that make more clear, more clarity, okay? Not in, uh, involve too many uh, emotion. Yeah. And uh, not manip manip ma manipulate by the emotion. Yeah. And uh, how I will apply, I. I think that I will, uh, yeah, take time to see the uh, important information with more objective uh, way. That's my application. Thanks. That's my part. 
Nice. Thanks, you may. Julia and then Tomomi. Julia, do you feel ready? Yes. Yeah, thank you very much, Jim, for this session. And thanks to everyone. There were many uh, questions and comments that really resonated with me. Uh, what I take away, well, first of all, the practical, you know, the videos as a teacher, I can share that with my students and with other teachers. So thanks for the resources. Um, I take away also the, um, you know, the comments when you responded to my question, Jim, about uh, it was a good reminder that needs are not good or bad by themselves. And also what you, the definition you give to bad intentions about harming other people. Mm -hmm. So that was a really good reminder. Um, I and I go also. I, I take away a question. So about not debunking someone or debunking someone uh, or debunking a, a truth that someone says. That there is a question about uh, like yes, I agree with the way giving empathy to that person, but it becomes much more complex when we're in a group of people. If I debunk the person, I give her the impression I am with the. I'm the opponent, but if I don't, I give the impression to the others that I'm with that person. And if I give empathy, I give even more the impression that I'm on that her side. And then it becomes really complex about what is the message I give to others. And yes, so that, that's something I, I keep in mind. Um, how to go about it, how to, yeah, I think you got my point. Yeah, something that all trainers, I think, chew on a lot. Because, and I see if this is your, a match for your experience, Julia, that uh, are you worried that empathy for one person might be perceived as agreement by that person? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. By that person and by the other person, people around. And then I lose uh, a connection with those people in which so i by trying to establish connection with one i lose connection with the others yeah. Yeah. yeah i think that's something that we need to stay alert to and that's why nbc is more than just empathy why it has the honesty built into it yeah right yeah. thank you uh tomomi and then vega Hi, Jim and everyone. Thank you. My takeaway is the stimulus you gave me and, you know, some um, ideas to explore and experience. Like every time you explain something, it's like there's some body reaction, like, oh. and then there's a judgment comes up, like, you know, um, when Jen and you were kind of like doing the role play and I was like, oh, I can't do, you know, I don't know what to do that. And, you know, I have a judgment and then maybe I just, you know, say so there's a judgment towards me and I, while I was closing my eyes for two minutes by the way two minutes was I, I what I needed one minute would be too short <laughs> so thank you for that um I was thinking how can I be non-violent more non-violent you know every day when I have a lim I notice limitation I try to think of some practice to work on it so um, I saw you demonstrating, you know, when you, uh, there's some misinformation or you know, disagreement or anything like, you know, you trying to maintain the connection and with empathy. And I was thinking current me and the vision or where I want to be, there's a gap. How can I close the gap? And I want to integrate the, this vision and me, you know, getting closer and closer. And again, I, my practice, I'm thinking my request to me, currently thinking is um, quite basic, transforming moral judgment into me judgment. So yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. So yeah. that's takeaway and gratitude and how to apply. Thank you. Thank you, Tomomi. Wow. Uh, Vega and then Winnie. Yeah. Um, today I have many takeaways. Uh, basically, I got more clarity about observation, um, evaluation, and information. And 
also intention and needs. It was a very good reminder to know differences in between. At the same time, yeah, I don't know what to do with them yet. <laughs> yeah. And also I see myself when there is information because I am getting every day a lot of information of what's happening time. Like, yeah, and what we needed to act and all those things. There's, there is this immediate reaction. <laughs> for I personally and also collectively so yeah just have questions and what can be the best and what I can do yeah it's just still the thoughts are there yeah thank you thank you happy to provide some stimulation for you Winnie and then Corey uh, yeah uh, it was the first time I heard the words uh, misinformation and disinformation, uh, debunking and pre-bunking. Uh, I've learned the difference between between them. But this, uh, I also have a question. Uh, the in the incoherence may lead us uh, that we hear what we want here. Uh, it's e easier to make uh, make a a judgment. Uh, so is the feedback uh, quite important? Uh, th th that's my question. Uh, and uh, uh, these videos, uh, they spoke so fast that I, ca I couldn't follow them. And I just got the two keywords, uh, Delma and uh, Diagnosis. Yeah. Uh, in word, uh, it's a great advance for me uh, in, the, uh, in these two hours. Uh, I feel uh, quite uh, relaxed. And uh, thank you, Jim, and thank you all. You're welcome. I like your question, and I, I don't know how to answer it right now. Now, if you click on those YouTube links, you will not get to the videos, Winnie, because YouTube is blocked in China. But on the last page of the notes is the link to Cambridge University. And that's probably OK. The, all the videos are there as well. So those you'll probably be able to watch on that site if you're curious to watch them. OK, I got it. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Corey? Yeah, um, first of all, I just want to say I'm so impressed with Winnie and all the other people with English as a second language. <laughs> I'm just amazed what you can do. Um, so that inspired me today and I appreciate in this group connection. And I was really, I think my takeaway is similar to what Julia brought up. There's like, I'm left with a dilemma around how do I handle certain circumstances where I really need, there's a real need for honesty. Um, in some cases, it's absolutely important. And yet how to, to you know, like Julia just laid it out, it's, it's tricky. And um, I, I heard someone recently, I can't remember who it was, but it was somebody in government on some YouTube, and I was really impressed and it was, they, it's not the way we think of empathy, but they acknowledged the other side. They just said something like, I can imagine your difficulty. Blah, blah, blah. And there was definitely a leaning into it, but not like a long time. But it was enough that it was like, I can't, you know, when I got the intention was, um, I'm, the person was acknowledging their pain and start with something like that. And that they're, you know, challenged and whatever. And then they still had to tell them the perspective of the government. You know, in other words, I hear you, where you come from, and da da da. So I think that's an option for us to at least to think about for me, how could I I'm trying to think about how could I briefly say um, 
even my dilemma, you know, like I want to, I want to show that caring when people have a different opinion and I'm worried that it'll look like I agree with them. What if I started it that way? And then I just said, you know, so I, I don't, I don't agree, but I can understand the amount of pain this person or something. Yeah. There's got to be a way where I can, I can just, you know, let the people know this is not my opinion, but I want to still show compassion. Yeah. So I wonder if we could practice that some time and carry this forward. Because that would seem like a really useful, like, breakout room practice, you know, like, how could we figure out how to do both? Right. Yeah. yeah. If we had the whole, if we had, a, this would be great for a weekend workshop yeah. to actually uh, have more practice. So maybe you can do it in your own practice groups, figure out, uh, in fact, um, if you'd like, <clears throat> uh, first, let me just check out and to say how much fun it was for me to present something brand new. That's what I love about this particular class is I hardly ever know what, what I'm going to teach until a few days before. And um, I know, I just know the intention is to relate NBC to social change. And so I learned so much, not only from what my research was, but from your comments and the clarity that you provided and the questions that you asked. So I really appreciate that. And uh, anybody who wants to stay, I, I, maybe we take a quick three minute break to do a bio break. Anybody who wants to stay and get some practice role playing, I, I have a role play in mind that I think would be fun. It's not, it's, I don't think it would be emotionally charged. There's no trauma alert. There's no, nothing political in it. And, uh, and I'll play the role of somebody who has a strange belief and you guys can empathize with me and we can play with that for 10, 10 minutes or so if you'd like. So if you want to stick around and do that, um, we'll do that. And I'll leave, it, leave the recording on for that, but we'll just pause for two minutes. <clears throat> if you need to leave, I totally understand, but I'll be back here in um, two minutes and uh, to play if anybody wants to play. I just need to stretch my legs. Thank you all for coming. Aloha. Thank you. So great. Thank you. Yeah. So this is a little supplement to the last little um, session, a, a chance to uh, to practice. The setup is um, I'm an elderly or an older um, um, relative. So um, I, I probably have a little bit of rank, uh, you know, um, and uh, but I also you might have some opinions about old people, especially when you get to my age and so forth. And uh, but you love me, you love me and you care about me. OK, <clears throat> all right. So what I'll do is I'll just say a little bit and then I'll pause and then you write down what you think you might say to respond to me. So I, I read the most amazing thing on the internet yesterday and I saw a YouTube video about it. It's, it's just, I, I'm just so, um, I have filled with so much hope because of this video. Did you know that you've been being lied to ever since you were a child? That Santa Claus is really real. He's alive. But he's been trapped at the North Pole by the United Nations because the United Nations is a tool of big corporations and big governments. So they don't want Santa Claus going around giving away children's gifts at Christmas. They want to be able to sell their gifts at Christmas. They want to suck us into consumerism. And so I'm just so angry to find out that I've been lied to my whole life, that Santa Claus is actually a prisoner of the state.
So who wants to try out your response to me? No, no mistakes. Everything's just uh, for learning. So there's no right answer here. I've got one that, yeah, yeah. Jim, would you like to be able to help with this? You seem really excited about this and yeah, you'd really like to help. Yeah, that's right, Jen. You know I me, mean, the world needs to know about this. We need to do something about it. Okay, we'll rewind back again. Who else wants to try one? Um, Jim, it sounds like you're really excited and also I heard a joy and surprise to hear that uh, Santa Claus is actually alive and perhaps uh, your hope for magic and wonders is really nourished. Absolutely. You know, I mean, if, if we could just free Santa Claus, then the world would become a magical place again. Exactly. Thank you. I'm glad you agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> so we rewind again. Somebody else want to try one? I could go. Um, so Jim, I wonder if uh, reading that ad really connected you to your childhood and perhaps the the sadness you felt when you didn't think Santa Claus was real and uh, this is just um, giving you joy and hope. Well, I do feel joy and hope and I'm also angry that I've been lied to for mm -hmm. the last 70, 70 years, you know, so uh, I just can't believe I've been living a lie. It makes me wonder if anything I've, I've ever been told is true when I learned this. Yeah, you have some real concern and anger about that. Yeah. yeah. Hear that. Somebody else want to try? Tomomi, did I see you about to unmute? Uh, Vega unmuted herself first. Okay, yeah. go ahead, Vega. Um, you might have um, many got shocked by what you just heard about that, that. Um, and you want this truth to be known to everyone. So, so transparency, maybe. Yes, absolutely. Wow, nobody listens to me like this. That's amazing. So let's just say that, um, I, I don't know if Winnie's still here, so we'll just keep going. <clears throat> um, let's say that I, that um, Julia did what she said, said what she said, and I responded. And the last thing that I said to Julia was, I'm so glad that you agree with me. So now think about what, what you might say in response to that. I'm so glad that you agree with me. Okay, Tamomi. I'll go. Jim, I'm not quite sure if I agree with you yet. I want to know more. So can we continue this dialogue? What do you mean you don't agree with me? You just told me that that uh, you, you were able to say everything that I just said. So I, I'm confused. Now you're telling me that I'm a liar? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do we continue the dialogue or we, yeah. we, we rewind? Whichever you rewind? prefer, whichever you prefer, Julia. Okay. Well, I would like to rewind. So like mm -hmm. after you say, oh, it's great to see you agree with me. It's great that you um, could say. It's uh -huh. just such a relief, yeah. <laughs> um, it sounds like you're, you, uh, you're really happy um, you really would like to, uh, ah, no, I don't know, to have some sort of togetherness in this, uh, yes. uh, this belief. 
Exactly. It's mm. not a belief. It's the truth. But I need right. I need support because I mm -hmm. you know, uh, I'm not alone. You know, I checked on the, the YouTube and it said that there were 750 other people who believe this. So I, it must be true if that many people believe it. 700, nobody gave it a thumbs down. So everybody's giving it a thumbs up. They're making these comments. So I feel like, and I want you on my team. You know, I want somebody that's young and energetic that we, we need to free Santa Claus. And it's going to take, it's going to take a lot of us. Can we push pause for a second? Sure. All right. Something that's a wondering that's coming up for me because you are a little bit older and and yeah, there's some rank, like you said, like in position and family. But yeah, what if what if we're actually seriously concerned that it might be dementia or something and arguing with you is going to to create problems? Well, I guess that's probably why we're in NBC is arguing is going to create problems anyways. Never, maybe my question doesn't matter. Yeah, just actually said, yeah, worried that disagreeing with you yeah. could cause harm yeah oh. uh if there's dementia he'll he won't remember it tomorrow though <laughs> ah you go Most likely. or a variation no thank you yeah <clears throat> can i tr can i try one jim because i want to try bringing in honesty can we go, go okay there? let's let's see what happens Okay, so we how about say again? I'm so glad you agree. I'm so glad you agree with me, Corey. It's just such a relief to, to know that somebody else in my family doesn't think I'm crazy. Yeah, Uncle Jim, you know, what I want to tell you is I, you know, I'm so fond of you and I always want to support you and for you to know I support you. And our relationship is really important to me. Um, so I want you to know I'm together with you that way. And at the same time, I feel an obligation to be come from my own truthfulness. Would you like to hear, hear about it, you know, where I might not agree with you? Oh, this sounds like you're going to do some of that NBC crap on me. I already told you that I think that's a manipulative bag of crap. <laughs> so I don't think that's going to work. <laughs> yeah. We'll push the pause button. You're giving me the third degree, Jim. <laughs> okay, so do you want me to continue or let sure. somebody else take it? If you, if you want to, want to you, you can. Okay, um, the NBC crap, yeah, well, yeah. I, actually, I don't think I did NBC right then, actually. I just was letting you know. Um, I want to support you, and I also want to be in, speak about my own truth. That's just how I feel. I see. I Not really see. NBC, but I just want to know if you want to hear it because I don't really want to push it on you if you don't want to hear it. Yeah. Yeah. Try rewinding it and make a different request. Try try asking me to reflect what's important to you. See what happens. Okay. Um, so what did I just say? Where are we going back to? Yeah, you said uh, that you you um, something about uh, you really care about me. Uh, and uh, you also want to speak your own truth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, we have this great relationship, and I always want to support you. And at the same time, you know, sometimes we differ, and so I'd like to, uh, to know if you want to hear about that. Yeah, and so instead of saying, instead of asking me if I want to hear about it, say, what are you oh, hearing? That's right. I forgot. Okay, so... Let's see, instead of asking, okay, sometimes we differ. Um, and I, yeah, I also want to share what's um, authentic for me or, you know, my, I don't know what I, word I would use, probably not authentic, but just the way I see it, I'd really like to share what I see it so I can be in integrity. And um, yeah, so I, I just wonder if, you would like to tell me um, what you think is important to me right now. Yeah, well, what I what I get is you love me. That's mm. true. And there's also something about um, you. You want to find a way to, um, to to disrespectfully disagree. I mean, respectfully disagree. 
<laughs> you probably say the first one. <laughs> ah, this is too much fun, Jim. Um, yeah, yeah, I'd like us to be able to stay connected and, you know, can have our wonderful relationship continue and also disagree. Yeah. And, and you know, even with strong feelings sometimes, we think that might be interested in giving that a try. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe so. Can you can you pass the turkey dressing? <clears throat> <I'm hungry. laughs> so um I like that. So um you know uh it's a little tricky for me uh, to mix both empathy and honesty in a single pass. So what and that's how I took what you did, Corey. <clears throat> it's challenging for me to hear both your empathy and your honesty, because my my brain, and it could be just because I'm so NVC ified, my brain gets confused about what's going to happen next. If I hear someone's empathy, I know what's expected next and if i hear somebody's honesty and then now i know what to expect but if i hear both i i feel um confused so that would be the first thing would be to um take marshall's advice which is take your time just choose one either empathy or honesty first get the connection as best as you can probably empathy is going to get you more connection than honesty and then um and then go to your honesty and end on a clear and present request. If you do ask for feedback, <clears throat> what comes up for you, Grandpa or Uncle Jim, then make sure that you don't have an agenda anymore. You go right mm. back to um, being just in empathy and not trying to argue, yeah. not trying to build your case or collect evidence. Right, because most people, particularly older, older, older people whose brains are working so great, wouldn't be able to do that. Most yeah, likely. I mean, just, you know, cognitively, they can't probably do it, but yeah. So what I'm hearing you say, Jim, is it might be more effective, at least for you, to really separate out the empathy and the honesty and give it some space. Yeah. So, yeah. so you really kind of get one clear thing and then before you should. Yep. Okay. That's my coaching. So probably what I would need if I got a little bit worried is to do some um practice of keeping my mouth shut and self-empathy yes yes because i tend to get i tend with some people you know you know how they're going off the deep end in in, in the united states i mean really the absurdities people are believing in much more than santa claus is alive and yeah. it's i get scared i get really scared yeah. like how could this person who i has a master's degree literally and sending me this email of this fill in the blank four letter word that's just hogwash. Yeah. So I get scared. And so I think it's partly I have to tend to my own fear, you know? Yeah. About, oh my God, what's happening to people, you know? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, learning to take care of your own fear, maybe getting empathy from somebody other than Uncle Jim would be yeah. one thing. You get hmm. empathy from Vega or Julia or yourself anybody else and so that then when you're with uncle jim you're purely in wonder mm -hmm. hopefully but i might still be scared you know and so i might logically i probably still be a little scared and i might just need to put my hand on my heart and breathe you know while i'm listening because i'm having a hard time but yeah. i don't expect myself to step out of fear necessarily but just manage it so yeah. i can do well that makes a lot of sense that makes a lot of sense um let's see there's something else that came up for me about that um yeah i, I think i think i said it that that the antidote <clears throat> for it may not be an antidote but the support for me for uh, fear is curiosity and um you know so like like i want to be aware <clears throat> of my own bias so like like if i end up talking to my my uh, QAnon friend or the person that's on the opposite end of the political spectrum of me 
I, I want to get clear on why I'm opening my mouth. Do I want to connect? Or do I want to correct? And if I want to correct, then I may as well be honest about it because it's going to come through anyway. Grandpa, you want to have a debate? I've got some facts. I've been doing my own research. You told me to do my research and I found, you know, so you know where that's going to go. So I, 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 I don't recommend it. So, oh, here's what I was going to say. <clears throat> so what you, one technique that I have heard <coughs> that can be effective, not based on the study that we talked about earlier today, but to say something like, let's say um, I'm the one who's the expert on Santa Claus or then at least I've done more, more YouTube videoing about Santa Claus than you have. So you defer to that. You use that rank to create connection. So grandpa, sounds like you, you know more about Santa Claus uh, in this whole, whole thing about uh, trapping him in the North Pole than I do. Tell me more, kind of like what Tomomi said. Tell me more. And then as you unpeel more of the, uh, of the uh, data, you'll, you'll be able to sort it by disinformation, misinformation, and information. And then uh, you might even say something like, um, you might, there, there's some, a technique uh, that's not empathy, <clears throat> but uh, it's taught by someone who studied quite a bit with Marshall. It's called a gentle challenge. So you might be able to make a gentle challenge to the information. So um, somebody says, yeah, I, 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 I heard on YouTube and, and I saw seven videos about the Santa Claus thing. And then I ordered a book from Amazon about it. And it, it really um, it really convinced me. And so then you might say, oh, so uh, you empathize with that first. So it really clarified things for you. Yeah, it really clarified. So tell me, Grandpa, Uncle Jim, why do you choose to trust that book? And then you go back to being open. And then you'll just learn more about about why they believe what they believe. And eventually they might, if you keep kind of doing that gentle challenge, they might just say, well, you know, actually, I don't know why I believe that. Why would I believe them? I, I think I need to go do a little bit more of my own research. <clears throat> yeah, I like that a lot. It's a, it's, um, it's Philip put it in their, in their camp. It's not, it doesn't really feel like exactly a challenge, but more like curiosity. Yeah. Yeah. In, in uh, NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, they, the, the suggestion, which is similar to empathy before education, but it's a little bit different, is um, pace before leading. Pacing before leading. So pacing means you're just walking with somebody. Leading means you're now pulling them by the hand. And so what you really want to do, Corey, if you're worried about this, uh, this person and their, uh, their well-being, you probably want to lead them towards a source. But if you do it too soon, you'll set up resistance. So you pace, you pace, you pace, you pace, you pace. You take your time. Like with my friend who went down the QAnon rabbit hole, it was approximately six months of her family just sticking with her and loving her through it and not fighting with her anymore, but saying, you know, we get, we get you that this is important to you. And this is what you're thinking right now. And we're really with you. And we've looked into it too. We've taken your advice and, and done our own research and we're not buying it, but that came much later. It took her five, five or six months to be able to be ready to hear that. Okay. I, I, don't, I don't think I would be an integrity, you know, especially if somebody asked me if I agree, I wouldn't say I did, but I, um, I would still want to try to maintain the connection. I do have a friend who's gone down that path. Yeah. And I'm looking on her Facebook. She's one of these people that uses it like a journal, like almost every day for a year. So what I can see is it's her community. She's influenced by all the people around her, of course. Yes, just like we all in NBC influence each other. It's the same thing. It's really obvious. It's really. And, it, but 
Sure. It's very, it's, it's the environment. It, it shapes our, it, our, it shapes us. So, uh, and, and then she belongs to a, a religion that is pushing, uh, I don't know exactly QAnon, but, you know, all the Trump stuff. So, sure. so then I could just say, tell me about it, you know, and um, how did this evolve? I'm really curious. And she's also an NBC. She used to live in California. She now lives in the South. That was three years ago when we got into NBC. So she's still, I can look on Facebook, she still uses NBC. Yeah. And it's very interesting. But um, she's just been influenced, you know? And I, so I clearly get that message to walk with her and try not to have an agenda because it really doesn't matter if she changes to me one way or the other. Yeah. But I, I'm kind of horrified that it's someone who I thought was such a free thinker, you know, such an individual or uh, had autonomy has been so influenced. It's, that's scary to me. Yeah, it is it's scary. scary. It's, it's scary for yeah. me too. And, you know, I've been, I've been studying um, high demand groups. Uh, the, the slang word is cults. But I've been studying high demand groups uh, probably for the last 35 years. And it's so clear that the needs that are being met by joining those groups it's the same needs that we're meeting with with uh, with NBC it's community belonging learning support um, nobody joins a cult but some some people who um, join a cult end up getting uh, under the influence of somebody who um, <clears throat> only cares about their own needs and they don't really care about the needs of the of their uh, the people that are following them and it ends, it ends up in violence, sadly. <clears throat> you probably heard of Jonestown and some other things like that. Yeah, Jim, I just want to say something before we close too, is I noticed with your, this role play in a big way, how quick, like how soon I needed a lot of self-empathy and not like jump in, as soon as you said YouTube and a book, it's like, whoa, 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 just want to stop you before you say any more. They was a, and then noticing more how it would be really difficult for me not to like want to talk to your family and get the computer away from you like and I'm I did not see that in me before like say so yeah, I gotta empathize with myself there's something important yeah. to me yeah. and and I don't want to be violent like that and I can see where it would cause a lot of harm to take away all seniors well or teenagers everyone's devices that doesn't work anyways to try and get rid of the misinformation oh. just doesn't work no yeah no it's it just it, it just imposes another hierarchy or demand system exactly. on exactly so i i found an edge that uh yeah i'm gonna create some kind of practice so that's, thank what, you. Yeah, that's what i yeah. loved that's what i loved about the pre-bunking idea and i'm so glad there's research to back it up because pre-bunking supports self-trust self-trust is the antidote to authoritarian systems authoritarian systems thrive on their members losing self-trust and instead focusing on whoever the guru or the um, teacher or the president or whoever it is as the authority they they do the thinking for me i don't have to think anymore so it's that's why i love about mvc is as far as i can tell it's an anti-authoritarian system it undoes that domination and as soon as i discover the opposite i'm out of here all right well i gotta go Thank you so much. It was really a lot of fun playing the role play with you. Thank, <laughs> thank you very much. I enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it too. It was great. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you very much. <laughs>